Thank you for showing up. Um, I'm going to talk uh, today a little bit about our um, history of immigration in this country um, and uh, tie it into a discussion of where we are currently. Um, but I want to start, um, those of you who have seen me um, uh, do presentations before know that I like to ad lib a lot. Um, and I just kind of like to, you know, uh, say whatever's on the top of my top of my head and go from there. Um, but because of, because of what we're observing this week, um, and because of the importance of this, I did actually write some stuff down for once. Um, don't, uh, if you're if you like my tangents, I will probably wander off on one of those uh, shortly. Um, but I did just, wa just want to start with some prepared comments because. I think um, for the place that we're at in American history today, they are necessary. And um, as we're celebrating the, um, the life and legacy of Dr. King, it's really important to remember um, that for many of us, these are actually really dark times. Um, since uh, the uh, election in 2016, um, things have changed pretty drastically uh, in America. We've seen a resurgence of white supremacy, of nativism, and hatred in this country that threatens um, not only the accomplishments of Dr. King, but also um, our very identity as a nation. We have tended, um, we tend to pride ourselves on being a melting pot, on being a country that welcomes people from around the world and out of this mosaic of cultures forges a unique identity. We are and always have been a country of immigrants. Yet some continue today to believe that this is a white nation. We've seen the march in Charlottesville, Virginia and around the country, emboldened by the hateful language of our president. But this is really nothing new. For the entirety of our history, some whites have claimed this country as theirs and theirs alone. They have sought to disenfranchise, terrorize, and ban those who look, talked, or practiced differently than them. They have labeled us criminals, rapists, threats to racial purity, and to the very safety and peace of the nation. But this has never been a white country. These are Native, these are Native American lands before they were, quote unquote, discovered by Europeans. When Europeans came to this country, some of them brought with them African slaves, the ancestors to many in the black community. Mexicans lived and worked in the Southwest long before it was part of the United States. And our Asian brothers and sisters came here to work in the 19th century to lend their sweat and blood to this country, even though they could not become citizens. This week, as we reflect on Dr. King's legacy and race in America today, it's important to recognize that nativism and the nativism and racism that we see from this administration is nothing new. There is the tired cliche that those who do not remember the past are doomed to repeat it. And I fear this is what we're seeing today. For too long, we have failed to acknowledge the continuing legacy of nativism, racism, slavery, and segregation in this country. So now we're repeating it. Today, I want to talk to you about that legacy and specifically about the treatment of immigrants because it's important for every American to know and also because we must understand and acknowledge our past if we actually want to break out of this cycle of hate. And so I'm going to cover uh, a lot of history on immigration um, over the course of these next slides. Um, if there's any questions along the way, please feel free to raise your hand. I'm happy to answer them. But really, um, what this talk is about is about how we've constructed immigrants in America. Because while we celebrate our immigrant legacy in this country, a lot of this has been wrapped up in trying to keep people out, trying to form an identity that excludes many. Today we talk about Muslim, we talk about Latino, but in the past it was Catholics, it was the Irish, it was the Chinese or the Japanese. And so I'm going to run through this and I've included in, this, uh, in these slides um, some uh, historical cartoons because I think they help to set the stage. And I want to lead off um, with uh, some quotes uh, or two passages from a speech that Barack Obama gave in 2010. Um, he said, we define ourselves as a nation of immigrants, a nation that welcomes those willing to embrace America's ideals and America's precepts. That's why millions of people, ancestors to most, most of us, 
braved hardship and great risk to come here so they could be free to work and worship and live their lives in peace. The Asian immigrants who made their way to California's Angel Island, the Germans and Scandinavians who settled across the Midwest, the waves of the Irish, Italian, Polish, Russian, and Jewish immigrants who leaned against that railing to catch that first glimpse of the Statue of Liberty. This is the first part of our myth or our national identity as an immigrant country. Yet at the same time, we're standing at the border today because we also recognize that being a nation of laws goes hand in hand with being a nation of immigrants. This too is our heritage. This too is important. And the truth is we've often wrestled with the politics of who is and who isn't allowed to enter this country. At times there has been fear and resentment directed towards newcomers, particularly in periods of economic hardship. And because these issues touch on deeply held convictions about who we are as a people, about what it means to be an American, these debates often elicit strong emotion. This was back in 2010, and things haven't changed much. If anything, we've seen a regression in this country. We've seen a stepping back. And we've seen an emboldening of white supremacy and hatred. Our Latino brothers and sisters, our Muslim brothers and sisters, live in an America where they have to feel nervous about when they leave their house. They have to be worried, including, and I've had students in my, in my class say this, that they were worried about going out and walking on the street because people yell slurs at them as they're walking. But this isn't the country that many of us believe that we should be. And I think it's important to keep in mind that we have to be optimistic about where we can get together. And so by looking back at this, at this past, by looking back at how we've characterized past generations of immigrants, <clears throat> that can help us get a better sense of why we believe what we believe today. Because everything today is a product of our history. And in, 17, in 1755, Benjamin Franklin, one of the framers, um, stated that <clears throat> A colony of aliens who will shortly be so numerous as to Germanize us instead of our anglifying them will never adopt our language or customs any more than they can acquire our complexion. Now this is a quote that you can change some of the words around and you could be talking about Mexicans today or Latino immigrants. Uh, in this case Benjamin Franklin was talking about Germans. He also didn't like the Dutch all that much either. And this is a bit of a historical oddity to many of us. I'm half Irish. Uh, when I go back and I look at how Irish were characterized in the 19th century, with the same kind of simian features that were used to caricature African Americans during the same, uh, during the uh, period of slavery and segregation, it's kind of weird. Because uh, my uh, Irish uh, family, uh, in terms of skin color, they're some of the whitest pe folks I know. And yet, at one point, they were considered to be of a lesser form of whiteness. There were debates in Congress about the danger to racial purity posed by the Irish and Italians. And one of the ways that we get to where, to where we are in terms of immigration is that, as of 1790, the only way to become a citizen in this country was to be white. And this wouldn't change for a really long time. This was part of shaping, a deliberate shaping, of American, America's cultural identity. An identity that, at least for the framers, and for many generations of political leaders who came after, they wanted this to be an Anglo-Protestant country. They wanted those borders defended. Right? This was how you built a nation. You chose a cultural identity and many of them believed it was hard, if not impossible, to actually truly be the nation of immigrants that we supposedly were, because these, the myths that we have today existed then as well. And there was a great deal of suspicion of the foreign-born. If you go back in the congressional record, they stated that people born in other countries, in some cases, no specific country, but just people born in other countries, were more likely to be criminals 
that they made up the majority of people in um, uh, mental institutions. And this may have come in part from uh, the British practice of uh, transportation. Uh, if you haven't heard that term before, it was what you do with uh, a criminal population when you're a small, well, relatively small, comparatively speaking, um, island country, and you essentially put them on a boat and you send them somewhere else. And for a while, they sent them here. Uh, in particular, uh, people accused of religious crimes or ideological crimes. Anarchists, for instance. Uh, after we stopped taking them, where did they send them? Australia, right? Again, another country that saw um, a genocide against the native population, a claiming of native lands as lands of white settlers, and a country that today continues to deal with that legacy. And beyond uh, just the exclusion of non-whites from naturalization, there was a deep suspicion of certain groups of individuals who were technically considered white, right? Because uh, whiteness is usually taken to be synonymous with Caucasian. Does anybody know what a Caucasian is? From the, <laughs> from the region of the Caucasus. If you can trace your ancestry back to the region of the Caucasus, you're technically a Caucasian. If you're a Latino, you may be surprised to find out that you are Caucasian, and therefore you're technically white. Although the Supreme Court took care of that in 1924 when they said, well, this whole thing's just made up anyway, and you're not white unless other, wh unless other white people look at you and think you're white. And this was in uh, response to um, a gentleman who challenged uh, the categorization or the, uh, of him as non-white, by saying that he was a Punjabi Sikh, that he could trace his genetic lineage, or his, uh, sorry, his ancestry back to Aryans, that Aryans were technically Caucasians, and that therefore, if white and Caucasian were synonymous, he should be allowed to be a citizen. And the Supreme Court took a look at him and said, uh, no, you're definitely not what we're thinking of when we're thinking of white folks. So there was this, uh, this tendency to classify certain groups at this period, during this period as of a lesser form of whiteness. Uh, people of Irish ancestry, Germans, Poles, Italians. And many of these individuals had the same negative stereotypes at that point in time associated with them that we still deploy against immigrants today. They take our jobs. They break the law. They're lazy. Right? I mean, really, um, those same stereotypes kind of apply across racial groups and immigrant groups, just depending on uh, what historical time period we're talking about. But, the, but this, um, this tendency to see the Irish um, and other groups as of a lesser form of whiteness um, really spiked in the 1800s. And this is when uh, you saw a real push to actually develop legal means of keep, keeping these individuals outside, of excluding them. And there was um, a party, uh, this later, we now call them the Know Nothings. Uh, they first went by the Native American Party. That became the American Party, and then late, Today, they're largely called the Know Nothings, but they ran on an explicit platform of anti-immigrantism in the 1850s and anti-Catholicism. If you go back and look at some of the congressional debates during this period, some of the newspaper accounts, some of the cartoons, there was a fear that anybody who was Catholic owed their allegiance not to the United States government, but to who? The Pope that this would give the Vatican influence in America and would in some way degrade our religious identity as a Protestant nation. 
Now these stereotypes would shift a little bit. Eventually we became less afraid of Catholics, although you can still find some, uh, some academics on the right who claim that Latinos pose a threat to this country because Latinos tend to be Catholic and that we are going to fundamentally change um, American culture uh, because we're going to bring Catholicism with us. We're not afraid of the Pope anymore. We supposedly have a cool Pope now uh, that many people find um, a little less offensive and don't see him as trying to conquer America or anything like that. But um, there is still that fear by some. And this is represented, uh, this was a cartoon uh, in, uh, on the part of the Know Nothing Party. Uh, you see the Irishman and the German uh, running off of the ballot box. And again, this was one of the fears in regards to these groups that were of a lesser form of whiteness. Because even though they were of a lesser form of whiteness, what could they do? They could vote, right? That's one of the reasons that you denied people the franchise, right? That's one of the reasons you denied people the right to vote, is you take that right to vote away, you ensure that they can't get any political power, right? That you ensure that even racists in your country don't go, well, man, this is a close election. I don't really like black people, but they may be able to get me over that line. So maybe I should just uh, tamp down that segregation talk a little bit and reach out to some black churches, right? which is something that we would actually see um, in the uh, 19, uh, latter part of the 1940s, early 1950s. But they could vote. And so this was one of the reasons that a lot of these anti-immigrant groups wanted to see these individuals excluded. Because not only did they degrade America's racial character, but they also potentially had political power. And these, uh, these anti-immigrant attitudes were really, we didn't invent them. We didn't invent, America didn't invent racism. Right? These were um, European imports. It was European thinkers, German physiologists actually, who first came up, who uh, first kind of uh, came up with this idea that you could uh, divide people up into about like five people, five different races. And this was when classifying everything was kind of the, that was kind of the thing, right? And of course, um, if you're German, if you're a Caucasian, who are you going to say is at the top of that hierarchy, right? You're going to say, oh, people look like me. Nobody, nobody looks in the mirror and is like, uh, you know what? I'm kind of fall somewhere in the middle. I'm kind of average. So I'll put people like me right there in the middle. But man, Vietnamese people that had just so much better looking than me. I think they're just they look so much more aesthetically pleasing. We'll put them up a few notches. But this initially was an aesthetic classification. This didn't denote anything about your intellectual or moral capacity, but that would come later, right? And that would come with eugenics, ideas that you can measure parts of people's head, and that would tell you whether they were musically inclined or moral, or smart. Right? Anybody, have you ever seen the, that bust of a head with lines drawn all over it? Phrenology, right? This idea that you could, that there was something more fundamental to race. And that's something that we still have some belief in today. I wouldn't recommend anybody uh, visit the website Stormfront, uh, but if you ever want to get a snapshot of uh, what racist people think, take a look at some of those internet forums. They're weird. But it gives you an idea that some people still believe this, that there's something fundamentally different based on nothing but the color of our skin, which actually denotes nothing. And actually, genetically speaking, there's greater variation within races than between races. But we like to think of ourselves as in some way being fundamentally different. And so these fears of Catholicism, this notion of America as an Anglo-Protestant country, made many believe that anyone not from this stock degraded the nation. And here's an example of how the Irish were characterized. This is from a uh, British magazine. And you can see the simian features ascribed to the Irishman in a cage. This is the Irish-American dynamite skunk. 
and an, Amer an American advocate of indiscriminate murder. Now keep in mind, why were the Irish characterized in this way by the English? What was going on? They were colonized. Right? What do you, if you're Christian and you're claiming to be a good person, what do you do when you go and take their land, treat them as subjects, give them no rights? Well, you say they're in some way not really people. Right? They're in some way impure. Or they're less civilized, and therefore they need our civilizing influence. Europeans love that line. Right? We civilized them. We came to America and we gave Native Americans our wonderful culture, and therefore they should thank us. We're sorry about the genocide and all, but, and the broken treaties. But man, we gave you civilization. Right? The same thing they said the British said in India. We, we're, we raised them up. And these were based on European concepts, right? This was based on this idea that the Irish were closer to apes because you want to dehumanize the people who pose a threat to you. And you want to dehumanize those that you're mistreating because that provides a justification. And here in America, we compared the Irish in some cases to African Americans. This is from Harper's, Harper's Weekly which if you're looking for a whole bunch of old racist cartoons, uh, they're a great source of it. They just got pages and pages of them. And this shows uh, on one side of the scale, you see African American from the south. On the other side, you see an Irishman from the north. And they're balancing each other out. The Irish were the problem of the north and the blacks were the problem of the south. And a lot of the characteristics of the Irish were similar characteristics that, would, that were used uh, in discussing African Americans. Uh, this is a cartoon uh, from uh, the latter, the mid part of the 18th century, uh, 19th century, on Italians. And this show is called, it says, regarding the Italian population, they're a nuisance to pedestrians. They sleep in crowded apartments. If you're a Latino, that probably sounds familiar. Uh, the afternoon's pleasant diversions uh, is stabbing someone to death. And then you see uh, the way to dispose of them uh, is something uh, that we probably wouldn't advocate today. Uh, but you essentially putting them into a cage and dropping them into the water. And this, again, demonstrates where we, were at, where we were at at the time in terms of thinking about immigrant groups. And the thing that the Italians and the Irish had in common during this period is the Irish and Italians who were coming over were poor. Right? The Irish were fleeing the Great Famine. And they were coming over and they were poor and they were looking for work. And again, this tends to be how we characterize these groups. It's what we do to Latinos today. People who are pursuing the same dream that brought many of our ancestors here, we characterize their dream as somehow different. And this wasn't just limited in the 19th century to whites or to whites of a lesser form of whiteness. The actual first major piece of immigration legislation in this country that excluded people based on race was the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. And this declared all Chinese um, immigrants inadmissible. You could not come here. If you're a Chinese and you're already here, you, if you left, you could not come back. And there was a reason for this. The reason was the Chinese were no longer needed. They came here and they provided a lot of assistance, in particular in building the railroad from the East Coast to the West Coast. Once it was done, they moved off to do other things and suddenly the narrative turned into they're taking our jobs. They're putting good American men out of work. We don't need them anymore. The Chinese Exclusion Act didn't begin as some anti-immigrant measures do, it didn't begin 
with Congress or the president. This actually began with labor agitation in the United States, with labor unions uh, saying Chinese are being brought in as strike breakers. Right? Something that later Cesar Chavez would claim, and while Chavez was a great civil rights leader for Latinos, he was a great civil rights leader for native-born Latinos or for legal Latinos, but not necessarily so much for our undocumented brothers and sisters. And we're still coming in pursuit of that same dream. And this Chinese, the Chinese Exclusion Act was the first major act restricting immigration that wasn't just aimed at quote unquote undesirables. And you can see here in this, uh, in this cartoon uh, from the latter part of the 19th century uh, that they're breaking strikes, that they're begging, that they're voting multiple times, they're fighting, that they drink that they loaf, they're lazy. Now, uh, the curious thing about immigrants is we tend to hold uh, two somewhat conflictual stereotypes about them. One is that they're lazy, and the other is that they're putting American workers out of jobs, which really, when you think about it, doesn't make a lot of sense, because if you're lazy, you're probably not working all that hard, therefore you're probably not really competing for jobs. But we like, we like this characterization. Right? This is the stereotype of the Latino leaning back under a tree with a big sombrero you know, over, over his head. And this is something similar that was used in regards to the Chinese. And here we see a representation of the, that second stereotype. And it says, what shall we do with our boys? And you see the Chinese worker here has multiple hands because he's working so damn fast. And all of these poor, white, American workers are just standing out there with no job. And this really was used to demonize the Chinese. This and um, they're corrupting our women, which again was something that was very common um, in terms of both immigration but also race. Right? They claim that women were being um, seduced into opium use, taken advantage of by Chinese immigrants who ran these opium dens. And again, this is something that is not uncommon. Right? We would see this in regards to African Americans on multiple occasions and also continuing today in regards to the hypersexualization of African American, in particular men. Right, claims that they pose a threat to white women. And this, uh, and this says Uncle, Sa Uncle Sam's farm in danger, and again shows a wave of the Chinese here, shown as locusts, invading American lands. And again, this was very deliberate. If you want to keep people out, you have to scare people. It's today saying that Islam is a religion of violence. That Muslims are terrorists. You scare people and you create a justification for keeping them outside your political system, but also outside of your social system. Making them in, somehow, in some way fundamentally different, fundamentally lesser than. And so we have this basic te tension in the United States of this, our identity as a melting pot, but also this question of how you forge an identity out of a melting pot. And this is really in part because we're not the only nation to do so or one of a handful of nations to do so, to try to forge an identity that doesn't have a deep basis in the past, where we were trying to forge an identity and say, who, we, who are we? And in some of my classes, we do this exercise and we say, what is American? Right? What is this thing that we expect immigrants to assimilate into in coming here? Because right? that's what we hear a lot in regards to immigrants. 
Well, they just, they just don't assimilate. They don't do things that Americans do. And you know what the bizarre thing is, when we run through this list, we don't really get anything. We get cheeseburgers, right? Here's your Welcome to America kit. It includes a bag of McDonald's. We occasionally get NASCAR. I don't know if I have any, if there's any NASCAR fans in the room, but it, it does seem like a fundamentally American thing to want to watch uh, cars drive around in circles for like four and a half hours. <laughs> but we don't come up with anything. Well, they don't celebrate our holiday. Yes, they do. Uh, well, they, um, I got nothing, right? Because I can't say, well, it's because their skin's a little too dark or because they're not white, because that, that would make me a racist. So I'm gonna to try to say it's because they won't assimilate. Right, they retain some of their culture. Oh man, I saw these, I saw this, uh, this protest about DACA, and man, they were waving the Mexican flag. How un-American. Has anybody here ever been to a St. Patrick's Day parade? There's Irish flags everywhere, and there's, those flags are being waved by people who are like 160th Irish. Right? And yet we go, oh, that's cool. No, they're just celebrating their heritage. It's all good. But man, if a Latino does it, oh, they, they hate America. They don't really want to be Americans. Right? We're held to a different standard. If you're white, you can celebrate your ethnic heritage all you want. Hell, you can wave the Confederate battle flag around and we'll go, oh, well, you know what? They're just misunderstood. Right? But if you're somebody who wants to celebrate your ethnic heritage and you happen to be a Latino or Asian, right, or from the Middle East, we go, oh, that's, nah, sorry, that's not American. And so we have this tendency to classify our national, to form a national identity in a way that really sets up just an us versus them. We know we're American because we're not those folks that we're keeping outside. We're not those people who are identifying as being un-American. And in 19, uh, sorry, 19, uh, 1894, we had the, found, uh, the forming of the Immigration Restriction League. And this was <coughs> um, a group that really focused on uh, limiting the number of Jews, and Southern and Eastern Europeans who could come to this country. And the way they wanted to do it was a literacy test. And they would eventually get that literacy test, and then they would realize that a lot of the people who were coming actually passed that literacy test. And so then they were a little bit upset because they just assumed they were all illiterate. And then, they, and then that would lead to a further piece of legislation. But the Immigration Restriction League really pushed for an end to immigration from these countries that were seen as being less than pure. And again, a lot of this had to do with things like they're taking our jobs. Right? This is this says the inevitable result to the American working man of indiscriminate immigration. Right? They come here and they're poor. Right, they're taking bread and whatever that lump of yellow stuff is. I'm assuming butter, but that's a hell of a lot of butter. <laughs> but they're taking that from the tables of hard-working men. Right, we were talking in my class today about the Freedmen's Bureau. Right, it was set up following the Civil War to help slaves trans former slaves transition to freedom. Right, and we, uh, the, we, we had a, a cartoon about the Freedmen's Bureau, too. And it was the same deal. So white men working out in the fields with the lazy Negro, leaning, leaning there just collecting those welfare checks, essentially. Right? And this is the same thing we were saying with many of these immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe. They're poor, they're coming here. And keep in mind, back then we didn't have welfare. Right? There was no social safety net in America for them to leech off of. Back in those days, uh, if you wound up pouring down on your luck, you better hope your family likes you or you have some really nice friends. 
because otherwise you're relying on charitable organizations, which are pretty hit and miss, especially to, um, uh, during economic downturns. And this is uh, another cartoon from the latter part of the 19th century, and it says the greatest fear of the period that Uncle's, Uncle Sam will be swallowed by foreigners. And so this shows on one end an Irishman, on the other end a Chinaman, and they're both gobbling up poor Uncle Sam. And then, uh, probably because <laughs> the, uh, the Irishman is kind of sort of white, then the Chinaman eats him too. But uh, gets a variation on his hat for some reason. But this wasn't, uh, the problems with this did not go unrecognized by other immigrant groups, right? The problem, uh, the fact that Chinese immigration, I mean, sorry, Chinese restriction was likely to lead to the restriction of other groups. This didn't go unnoticed. This is another cartoon from the period, <clears throat> and it says, what color is, ta is to be tabooed next? Fritz, meant to be a German, to Pat. If the Yankee Congress can keep the yellow man out, what's to hinder them from calling us green and keeping us out too. And this is actually um, a little predictive of where things would go. Because of course, after the successful restriction of Chinese immigrants, restrictionists in this country were emboldened. The Gentlemen's Agreement of 1907 between the United States and Japan denied Japanese immigrants who wanted to come here to work visas. The 1917 Immigration Act gave the Immigration Restriction League, as I mentioned, their literacy test. And it also created the Asiatic Bard Zone, which essentially barred people from anywhere in Asia from immigrating to the United States legally. And this shows that during the period, this is from, I think, 19, uh, the early 1900s, uh, I think 1903, and this says, <clears throat> direct from the slums of Europe daily. This is another anti-Italian cartoon. And you can see them swimming out of the boat, characterized as rats, with hats that say mafia, anarchist, Again, this idea that we are being flooded with foreigners who posed a cultural threat to our nation. And while the literacy test was meant to keep these individuals out, it didn't work because, as I mentioned, too many people were passing it. And so what we got was the Immigration Act of 1924, also known as the Johnson-Reed Act, sometimes referred to as the National Quotas Act. And this set up a quota system for immigration. And this was specifically targeted at Southern and Eastern Europeans. I've read through all the congressional debate on this, and this was their goal, was to prevent Southern and Eastern Europeans from coming here. They capped immigration at 150,000, and they capped the quotas at 2% of the foreign-born present in 1890. So each country got a quota, each European country. Sorry, not every country in the world. If you're from, if you're from countries that were classified as being non-white, you were just lumped together into a racial category. And oddly enough, the people lumped into the kind of uh, catch-all Asian category, they still couldn't legally immigrate here. But they were given a cap anyway in case there was somebody in that country who wasn't Asian who wanted to come to the United States. But 2% of the foreign-born as of 1890. Anybody want to guess why they, why 1890? We run a census every 10 years. This is 1924. Why would they pick the census of 1890? Higher numbers of immigrants and lower Yeah, because uh, higher numbers of good immigrants, lower numbers of bad immigrants. 
right? So that was a way of tweaking the quotas to ensure that you were getting the people that you wanted to get. That you were setting the quotas as low as you could for these countries that you wanted to keep out. And it just excluded all of those in ineligible for citizenship. And for my Asian brother and brothers and sisters, you, you wouldn't actually be able to naturalize in this country until the 1950s. Right? This wasn't something, this wasn't one of those historical blips that was so far in the past. We tend to think of things um, in that way. But 1952, that's within a generation. Right? And one of the things that we have to keep in mind when we're talking about history or when we're talking about the civil rights movement is one generation is nothing. Right? One generation doesn't change anything. So with the restriction of European immigrants, which is relatively successful, uh, Congress next turned to Mexicans. Mexican immigration uh, in the Southwest had been seen largely as um, being a response to labor demands. Immigration officials on the Southwest border largely saw Mexicans as coming in when their work was needed and then leaving when their work was no longer needed. It was essentially an unregulated free flow of immigration across the southern border. Now that began to change in the 1920s. This notion that we should allow people just to kind of walk back and forth whenever they wanted to, that began to shift. And part of this was around the growing chorus amongst politicians that there was quote unquote a Mexican problem. And this is from the Fullerton Daily News in 1924. And you see the immigration official doing nothing while the Mexican peon, and this says ignorance and disregard for law, crosses in the United States right, without inspection. And Mexican immigrants, of course, are, uh, if you say, you know, let's talk about immigration. What are we talking about today? We're talking mostly about Mexicans for the most part, Latino immigrants broadly. But now, if, you, if, if you're talking about immigration, that's for the most part what you're talking about. Right? That's what people take that word to mean. Right? We're talking about illegal immigrants. And the curious thing was, was for a long period of this nation's history, they weren't illegal. Right? They crossed back and forth. When there was work, they came in. When there was no work, they didn't come in. And in 1929, we began to try to restrict Mexican immigration. The first was through administrative means, charging people a head tax to come into this country. And especially uh, poor Mexicans could not pay that head tax. So the idea was that they wouldn't come in. We also subjected them to uh, de-lousing baths before entering, because there was a perception that Mexican immigrants were dirty, were diseased. Um, we didn't do this to Canadians, by the way. And in 1929, there was a Senate Bill 5094 that for the first time legally criminalized undocumented immigration. It declared undocumented entry, the first instance of it, was a misdemeanor. And the second time, it was a felony. And if it was a felony, that meant that you could never legally immigrate to this country with a felony charge on your record. The Border Patrol was also formed in 1924. And it wasn't really to patrol the borders of the United States. It was to patrol the border of the United States, right? which remains our primary focus in this country. Right? There were illegal European immigrants coming in through Canada. We weren't really worried about them. We were worried about the southern border. And that was the focus of the Border Patrol during this period, and continues to be the focus of the Border Patrol today. In 1929, we also entered the period of the Great Depression, uh, what remains the biggest economic downturn in US history. And as a result of that, the desire to get Mexicans out increased. 
So this spurred a program of Mexican repatriation. And the idea with this was you threaten them with deportation. You threaten them with neighborhood and workplace raid. And they'll go home. And many did. Estimates vary between 500,000 and 750,000. About 20% of the Mexican population in the United States returned during this period, went back to Mexico. They weren't all, they weren't all undocumented. Many of them were legal, but couldn't prove that they were legally here. And therefore, they went back rather than face potential fines if they were believed to be here illegally. And this is something um, that we're actually seeing today. Donald Trump's immigration raid, they're not going to deport all 11 million undocumented immigrants in this country. But what they're meant to do is create a climate of fear to hopefully convince some of those immigrants to return home on their own. Because again, we, don't, we couldn't actually afford to deport 11 million people. Nor would we like the optics of putting people in boxcars to have them taken back to Mexico. Right? Especially uh, considering uh, what we like to believe about ourselves as a country. And there are also historical parallels to the denial of refugee status for many Muslim immigrants. In the pre-World War II period, and we typically forget this, in the pre-World War II period, we refused entry to Jews who were fleeing the beginnings of the Holocaust. We didn't get involved in World War II until the bombing of Pearl Harbor. We didn't get involved because we were concerned that Jews were being killed in massive numbers on a scale that was impossible to ignore. We only cared when Japan made the mistake of bombing us. We denied Anne Frank's family asylum here. And she became one of the most well-known faces of the Holocaust. She was killed. And all of those deaths, they lie on our national conscience. Because we could have done something different. We could have taken them in. And we chose not to. Not because of anything to do with the individuals, but because of the anti-Semitism in this country during that period of time. Right? Again, something that we're seeing today as we deny Syrian refugees the ability to come here and be safe. And we claim it's because of uh, we don't vet them closely enough or they could be terrorists when they're fleeing the very people that we're supposedly fighting. And they're saying, we want to come there so we can be safe. And a lot of people have died because European countries have refused. Again, because of the religion of the individuals. And also because of the color of their skin. If Syria was a, Christ a white Christian country, we'd be accepting them in droves. And some of the rhetoric of our current president also comes out of this period. America first. This was something that was used to keep us out of World War II, right? While the Holocaust was happening. Right? When we knew about what was happening there. America first. This is something that we say today. Right? We need to put the jobs and the health and the welfare of Americans before <coughs> the health and welfare of refugees. And this is, and some people, uh, many of you maybe, uh, uh, well, I'm assuming all of you have heard of Dr. Seuss, right? Um, many also, uh, well, many don't know that he also did a lot of political cartoons. And this says, and the wolf chewed up the children and spit out their bones. But those were foreign children, and it really didn't matter. And again, here we are today saying the same thing. Those are foreign kids. Doesn't matter if they die horribly. 
end if they die in a way that's preventable, where we could do something about it. Because you know what? Well, they're not, our, they're not really our problem. And a student, I don't remember which student, but a student uh, sent me this um, after one of my classes. And this is on the left, well, on the left, 1939, a Jewish family looking for refuge. And then on the right in 2015, a Muslim family looking for refuge. Again, we're, we are repeating the errors of our past. And in 20, 30, 40 years, we'll look back on this period with shame, with the same kind of shame that we have now in regards to denying all of those families, all of those people safe harbor in the United States, people who would be alive today, who would have grandchildren, maybe great-grandchildren, who could have become we don't know what. But instead, we left, them, we left them to the Nazis. And today, we're leaving them to civil conflict, to ISIS. And in, the after, in after World War II, we continue to demonize Mexican immigrants. We launched uh, Operation Wetback in 1954, a mass deportation program that I believe our current president actually somewhat referenced during one, uh, at one point. But this had the goal of deporting one million immigrants. Again, using drawing on tactics that were very similar to those used during Mexican repatriation. And all of this ties back to, and this is going to be the like 400th time my students have seen this slide, but this all ties back to what Roger Smith calls the tradition of ascriptive hierarchy in America. This notion that true Americans in some way are in some way chosen by God, history, or nature to possess something special. Something that makes us unique. And something that justifies treating others as second-class citizens. And this is usually tied to race. This is usually tied to gender. And sometimes this is tied to class. But it's a way of justifying it. It was, a way, it was the way in which we justified the taking of native lands. We manifest destiny. God wanted us to have this country. And today, We've also privatized the incarceration of immigrants. Private the private prison industry represented by GEO Group, the Corrections Corporation of America, who just changed their name to something that sounds less evil, slightly less evil. They make a profit now out of warehousing black and brown bodies. Immigration detention, the contracts that they got for immigration detention saved those companies from bankruptcy in the early 2000s. And now they sit at the table and help to craft immigration policy in this country. They help to ensure that we see more people thrown into detention facilities that are run for profit. And as a result of being run for profit, that means that they cut corners. The guards are undertrained. There was actually a lawsuit against Geo Group because they were making prisoners clean their own cells, cook their food, and they weren't paying them. Or they were paying them with things from commissary. And today, those same groups sit at the table with lawmakers and help to craft policy in the same way that they helped to craft our drug policy in, in the United States, which has resulted in the disproportionate incarceration of African Americans and Latinos. Right? While states like Washington celebrate legalization of things like marijuana, and in other states, people are still sitting out mandatory minimum sentences. 15, 20, 30 years for something that now would be legal in Washington. Why is marijuana legal now? 
Why now? Because everybody smokes. Seriously. That's what it is. You can't classify it anymore as a black thing or a Mexican thing. Right? Your, your, good, little con you know, your good little college student, Johnny, well, you know, he shouldn't be thrown in jail for 15 years for you know, slinging some weed on the side. Right? He's really a good kid. He has a bright future ahead of him. Now, if old Johnny was an inner-city African-American, oh, no, throw his ass in jail for as long as you can because, man, he's scary. Super predators, right? To quote um, Hillary Clinton, who then wondered why the black community wasn't overly enthusiastic about voting for her. And so I want to end um, just by talking a little bit about where we go. Because this is, I know, this is a lot of depressing stuff. I tried to introduce at least a few little uh, laugh moments here and there. But it's not particularly upbeat. But the one thing that I have a lot of hope in is that this moment that we're in right now inspires us to see the fight of one group as, as our fight. As Martin Luther King did, with Cesar Chavez. And he wrote a telegram to Cesar Chavez in 1966. And in that telegram he said, as brothers in the fight for equality, I extend the hand of fellowship and goodwill, and I wish continuing success to you and your members. The fight for equality must be fought on many fronts, in the urban slums, in the sweatshops of the factories and fields. Our separate struggles are really one, a struggle for freedom, for dignity and humanity. And that's what I hope we take out of this moment that we're in right now. That there's no difference between us. That we have to stand together because that's the only way that we're actually going to start to not erase our past because we shouldn't want to erase it. But that's the way that we move together towards our future towards realizing our national myths, towards be truly becoming that melting pot that we claim to be. And so um, I will stop, I promise, in just one second. But I, just, I, I also wrote up a just brief closing statement. So as I've covered in these last couple slides, um, from the very founding of this nation, we've looked on immigrants with suspicion. We've accused them of taking American jobs, have claimed that they're threats to our culture and to our very safety. And at the same time, we've too often been divided in our response. If we truly want to fight white supremacy, we have to do so together. We must realize that an injustice against one of us is an, uh, is an injustice against us all. The fight, of our the fight of our Syrian brothers and sisters is my fight too, despite the fact that I'm not Syrian and I'm not Muslim. The fight of our African-American brothers and sisters is mine, too, despite the fact that I'm not African-American. Martin Luther King saw this, as did Malcolm X, as did Cesar Chavez, as did Fred Hampton. We are stronger together and can only prevail if we actually realize that. And to our white, and to our white brothers and sisters, they also have to realize that in too, far too many cases, your silence is deafening. I've given, I've taught a lot of classes on race and politics. I've given a lot of talks at this point. And one thing in reaching out to the white community that I, that I just must stress is that you have to confront this with us. No more laughing at racial jokes. No more not having those uncomfortable confrontations with your racist family members or your friends who maybe send you an email with a racist cartoon. If you want to be an ally, you have to stand together with us. You have to face that same discomfort that anyone who's a racial minority faces every single day of their life. You have to stand up. Because if you don't, we don't break out of this cycle of hate. Those stereotypes 
are maintained within the white community. They're okay. Right? Because somebody laughed at your joke. He goes, your racist Uncle Joe, well, he can go off about how, uh, you know, he's worried about that black family that moved into his neighborhood, or he's worried about those Latinos taking his job. But this also goes beyond race and beyond our borders. We have to see that the, uh, the fight of oppressed people everywhere is our fight. And this is also something that the great civil rights leaders recognized. Because institutionalized racism isn't just a problem in America, it's a problem globally. And it's entrenched in the institutions that today dictate global trade, loans. As a, as a man, we also have to stand with our sisters. We're seeing an awakening in the United States that I think is really important right now. We're seeing a lot of discussions about sexual harassment, about misogyny, about unequal pay. And as men, we have to stand behind not just the women in our lives, but the women in this country as they fight for greater justice. We also have to stand with our LGBTQ family. We have to realize that their fight is our fight too. That transphobia, transphobia, homophobia, that we have to stand up to those things as well. Because again, their fight is our fight. And that's the only way that we move forward. And this administration really is based on nothing more than an edifice of hate. What we've seen the president do is nothing more than try to undo every single thing that was done by his predecessor, the first black president. And I believe, and I do believe that we'll come out of this stronger. I believe that this administration is helping us realize our common cause, our shared humanity, and our shared interests, regardless of our race, gender, sexuality, or gender identity. And I believe that we'll, we'll do all that we need to do to win this. And I believe that we'll, we face a brighter future because we're being forced to confront our past. And we'll meet the hate that we see in America. We'll meet it in the schools. We'll meet it in the state houses. And if necessary, we'll meet in the streets. And we'll win. Because this has never been a white country. This has always been our country. If you look around this room, this is America. And this is my America. And we need to move forward together to realize that. And I believe we will. So thank you. I'm happy to take any questions.